Okay, welcome back again. I'm Robert Breaker, and I've got a message prepared for you today that I think will be a blessing to you, I hope. Um, let me say, this is something that I had planned to preach probably four, five, six years ago. Um, I wanted to put this up a long time ago, but I've kind of been sitting on it. I haven't talked about this, and I'd like to apologize for that. I probably should have. It would have been good. So what we're going to look at today is the three parts of the first resurrection. And what I want to do is show you the three parts of the first resurrection and how in God's mind, what resurrecting from the dead is. You know, there's a Bible verse that talks about you plant a seed, and the seed cannot grow except it die. And then it grows. So, in this process of life that we all have to go through, there's a thing called death. Death is not the end. It's not. It's just the beginning. It's the beginning of eternity. And where will you spend eternity? Upstairs or downstairs? That's what it's all about. So, in God's mind, God looks at things as agricultural. And let's start in Exodus chapter 23. I'll read a couple of verses here and try to explain where I'm coming from. But what we see here is we see God calling out in the Bible a man. And his name was Abraham. He said, Abraham, of your seed, of your seed. Well, seeds are what you plant. So Abraham was a, a goat herder and a shepherd and a guy that lived out in the desert on his own. He was an agricultural person. Drank buttermilk, ate steaks, probably had some things planted, although in the desert you can't plant a lot of stuff, but there was some place and Lot wanted it, so Lot took it where you could plant some things. Well, when God finally gave to Abraham that promise of the land, God set up the law. And under the law, God says now, there's going to be the way that you live, and it all has to tie in with the cycle of a planting. And it's almost like God is dealing with them as farmers. Now, a lot more that I want to say, uh, but during that time, every year, God said, Now, Israel, I want you to remember these feasts. And God set up an agricultural society in Israel in which the Israelis would go out and plant their fields every year and then would harvest them. That's why to this day we talk about the end of the world and, and the resurrection as a harvest. And I'll get into those verses here in a minute. But if you get a chance, see my video on the seven feasts of Israel. I'm Robert Breaker. Look up on YouTube, Robert Breaker, seven feasts of Israel, to find out more about those seven feasts. But I want you to see this, and I want to talk about the three parts of the first resurrection and how in God's eyes, people being resurrected from the dead, which is going to take place and has taken place, eventually everyone is going to rise from the dead again eventually. And God's going to be the one that does it. And the Bible says, some to everlasting salvation and others to everlasting shame and contempt for everlasting fire. So today we're going to look at this and how God ties this in to like a planting cycle. So if you're a farmer, you'll probably understand this video much better than people who aren't. But let's begin in Exodus chapter 23 and verse 14. Exodus 23, 14. Three times thou shalt keep a feast unto me in the year. So there's three main feasts of the seven feasts of Israel. And I don't have time to get into that, so please see my video on the seven feasts of Israel. But during the seven feasts, which happened every year, three of those times of that feast, they had to go to Jerusalem. And they had to appear before the tabernacle. They had to come before where God dwelt. So God wanted to see them three times. And there's a reason for that because the feasts are not just an excuse for the children of Israel to go have a party. <laughs> they are actually prophetic. And if you know your Bible, you understand that these feasts are all having to do with future prophecies of the coming Messiah, which we who are Christians know is Jesus Christ. So these are the feasts. Now there's three feasts that they had to come before, and they are, number one, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, verse 15. Number two, the Feast of Harvest, verse 16. And then the third one is the Feast of Ingathering, which would be the last one, the Feast of Tabernacles. So you have these three main feasts, and during these, there's seven all total, but these are the three times every year God says, I want to see you. I want to see you coming before me. And they are prophetic of future events of three times throughout future history, even with past history, but throughout history, in which people will be resurrected and go before the throne of God. So it's amazing if you know your Bible. Now, if you don't know your Bible, I'll try my best to explain as much as I can. 
but it's kind of supposed that, that you are a Christian watching this, so you'll know some of the things that I'm talking about. If you don't, I do have other videos about certain things on YouTube, and I would encourage you to look those up as well. But let's, let's read here, verse 14. Three times thou shalt keep a feast unto me in the year. Thou shalt keep the feast of unleavened bread. Thou shalt eat unleavened bread seven days, as I commanded thee in the time appointed of the month Abib. For in it thou camest out from Egypt, and none shall appear before me empty. And the feast of harvest, the first fruits of thy labors, which thou hast sown in the field, and the feast of ingathering, which is in the end of the year, when thou hast gathered in thy labors out of the field. Three times in the year all thy males shall appear before the Lord God. So there were three times in which God wanted Israel to come before him. Now, I have to do this because I do this just about every time. I'm going to have to put up here the Bible as it's laid out in Scripture. And I have to do that because, well, I do that every, every time, so I want to do that. So if you know your Bible, you know the Old Testament. And in the Old Testament, why, before the cross where Jesus died, there was what's called the law. And the law was the Old Testament part of the Bible that was all for Israel. And that's what the nation of Israel is. It's God's chosen people. The name Israel comes from Jacob. Now, I don't want to go all the way back in the Bible, I mean, but uh, the law God gave to Moses. So Israel. Now, Jesus came. He died. And the Bible tells us and talks about what we call today the church age. And that's where we are in the Bible. We're in the time of the church, which is called the time of grace. For by grace are you saved through faith. This is called the church in which we're in today. The church age. It's going to end with the rapture of the church right here. So this will be the rapture. And what I'm doing is just laying out here what the Bible teaches in the past, but also prophetically in the future. And after the rapture, when the church leaves, then will show up on this world the Antichrist during the tribulation period. And by the way, and that will be a time when God goes back to dealing with Israel as well. But, at the end of the tribulation period, Jesus will return at the battle of Armageddon. So this will be Armageddon. And then he will set up his millennial kingdom. Uh-oh, kind of overlapped those, didn't I? And he will rule and reign, if you believe your Bible, and I do, for a thousand years. And then at the end of that thousand years, here, God's going to stop everything. And then he's going to have the great white throne judgment in which God will sit on his throne, and this is supposed to be a throne here, and he will judge the whole world. So this is what the Bible teaches about past events and future events. Okay. Now, in the Bible, God had a cycle he set up with the Old Testament law. And he told Israel, you're going to do things over and over and over in a certain way. And for some reason, God loves the number seven. <laughs> because God set up a week of days. And a week of days is seven days. So there's something about that number seven. And even to this day, what's amazing to me is a lot of the things that we do and practice today, because America was founded as a Christian nation, much of what we do, even in farming, goes back to the Old Testament law. And it's like we were saying, well, if that was good enough for God for them, then it's good enough for us. We're going to try to do a lot of the same agricultural things that they, that they do. And to this day, we have a seven-day week. Well, the children of Israel were told the last day, the Sabbath, was the day in which they're supposed to rest. Well, we uh, kind of keep the seven day week but we remember the first day not the last day and the first day of the week is Sunday so our calendar if you ever look at a calendar a lot of people think Monday is the first day of the week well that's the first day of the work week but the first day of the week on any calendar I'm looking at one right now is Sunday so but we do keep a seven day calendar a seven day week then they have a week of years years now, in the Bible, if you know your Bible, God told Israel to count seven times seven, to count 49 years. And then in the 50th year, he called that the year of Jubilees. And so God went by that. Uh, they had a sabbatical week of years. They had a, a week of years here. They had a, another week of years in which they called it a sabbatical 
Uh, and so what they did is on the seventh year, they rested in the land. Now, this is very interesting, and this goes back to agriculture. If you lived in Israel, you planted every year for six years, and then on that seventh year, you wouldn't plant anymore. And the reason being was, God said you have to let the land rest. And so basically what they did is they didn't do any planting. And because they had been planting in the same field for six years, they're using up all the nutrients in that field. So by letting it rest for a whole year, a lot of those nutrients were recuperated, and then they started over. Now, I've been up north and around here as well and talked to a lot of farmers down in the south, and they said they, they try to practice that too. And so throughout the last couple hundred years in America, they read their Bibles and they saw God gave them that law of on the seventh year, don't plant. And a lot of people still practice that today because they realize, you know what, that gives the land rest in order to get many of the nutrients back and then you can plant for another six years. But uh, look at the potato famine, look at uh, things like that in, in is it Ireland, uh, where they, they didn't do that. And so their fields got rid of all the nutrients because they just planted every year, every every year, never let it rest. And then the plants didn't do well, and they starved. There was much famine. So I just find that very interesting. So God uses the number seven. And a lot of the things that are under the Old Testament law that God said to do, we still practice today, even though we're not under the law, because they're good measure. There's something that's good. Matter of fact, they would plant by the moon. Well, you go buy an almanac at any hardware store. And guess what? It recommends you plant by this moon and things like that. Now, God also uses 280 days. And what is 280? It would be 70 times 7. And if you look at the Feast of Israel and the Feast of the Lord, they take place within a 280-day time period. And I just find that amazing. And you have what are called the Spring Feast and then the Fall Feast. And I do not have time to get into all of this. But you have your feasts, and you have the Feast of Passover. And then the next day starts the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And it's for 14 days. But you also, well let me write that up here, you have the Feast of Unleavened Bread. I'm going to run out of room up here for sure. Then a little bit later you have a feast called the Feast of First Fruits. And so you've got unleavened bread, you've got first fruits, you've got this will all tie into the seven feasts that I've talked about before. First fruits. Then you have 50 days after Passover, you have what's called Pentecost. Then you have, now these are these are the spring feasts. Then you wait a long while, and then you come back in the fall. Then you have the feast of trumpets. Then you have the Feast of Atonement. And then you have the Feast of Tabernacles. And that would be your seven feasts. Let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah, I got it right. Good. I can count. Amen. And again, God uses the number seven. Now, from here to here is a cycle of 280 days. I just find that very interesting. 280 days. So it's an agricultural setup and it's also which I find quite interesting 280 and I'll just I'll just put that number over here 280 days 280 days is the number of days that a woman is pregnant now some women they have their baby late some have their early but the average time that a woman is pregnant over the history of the world has been 280 days some people say well it's 40 weeks it's actually closer to 38, 39 weeks, and it's really in days. Many times they count it as 280 days. Now, you would plant based upon this thing. God set up this cycle, and he's saying, now you go by the moons, and you do the number seven, and you do what I say, and here's your seven feasts. And as you have your agricultural society, it's going to be based upon you guys planting and you keeping these feasts. So you did these feasts. Now, what does God say? Well, well, let me, there's a lot more I could get into. I don't want to get off too much on other things, but there are three types of agriculture in the Bible. There's grain, which would consist of the barley and the wheat, and a lot of this was barley and wheat harvested around this time. 
There was the fruit crops, vineyards, and, and they would plant all sorts of fruit. Uh, in the Bible, we have pomegranates and things like that. If you go to Israel today, there's so many different kinds of fruits. So you have your grains, you have your fruits. But then with agriculture, you would also have your cattle, you'd have your flocks, you'd have your sheep, your cows, your goats, and all those kinds of things. It's almost like modern day 4-H. <laughs> have you ever heard of 4-H? I am so sad that when I went to uh, high school that I didn't take 4-H. I could have. I always thought, well, that's dumb. And now, you know, I wish I'd taken 4-H. I would have learned a lot of great things that would help me uh, outside. I like to plant. Uh, I like animals. We had chickens at one time. We don't have any more uh, now, but we might get some more. But I, I wish that I had taken that now because that would probably help me understand the Bible more because the Bible is set up with God dealing with his people, Israel, in, in an agricultural way. And they got their land, and it was all about agriculture. Now, let's look at this. I printed this up, and I'm going to read this to you. The Jerusalem Post, and it's uh, September 26, 2019, the circle of a year. And so the Jerusalem Post talks about the festivals, these feasts, and how they correspond with agricultural society, which is what God set Israel up to be and how it has to do with planting, and how planting and harvesting all lines up with these feasts. The major Jewish festivals are symbolically integrated with the natural agricultural cycle of a year. So one whole year of 360 days, I guess, if you go by the moon, um, 280 of those days are the feasts from one to the other. And the way they come together, they all line up with agricultural. So God, who created seeds and plants and the world and the earth and the, everything, he wanted his people to enjoy it. He wanted them to plant. He wanted them to have cattle and things like that. And he did. Now, I'm going to read some more. It says, The process begins around the month of Kislev, November, December, with staggering sowing of the seeds over a period of four months. So way back here in December, November, they start to plant seeds. The first crops harvested are flax and barley around the month of Nisan, March, coinciding with the festival of Passover. Now why? Why do they begin planting before here in order to try to get a harvest around the time of Passover? Well, if you know your Old Testament law, God mandated that they bring what they got to God. They get the first fruits of what they've labored hard in and they bring it to God. Remember, three times they have to appear before God. And then when they come, they're supposed to come bearing gifts to their God. And so it says here, the month of Nisan coinciding with the festival of Passover. It is not coincidental that the barley Omar offering, today commemorated by counting the Omar, took place at Passover. The months of Sivan, around May, is the time of the wheat harvest and is reflected in the ritual service of the festival of Shavuot by the two loaves offering made from the newly harvested wheat. The summer months from Tammuz to Elul, June to August, are spent harvesting and gathering the summer crops and fruits. The cycle ends in the month of Tishri, September. It is a time to take stock, a time for introspection and for making resolutions and planning the coming agricultural year. This is reflected in the festivals of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, where one balances accounts, not with their material possessions, but with their spiritual status. According to the Jewish tradition, a person's livelihood for the coming year is preordained on Rosh Hashanah and sealed on Yom Kippur. So the Jews look at it as how spiritual you are, how blessed you'll be, and, and they kind of tie it into a little bit of a works gospel, which, you know, if you know your Bible, we're not saved by works today. But it's interesting to me how this whole thing is tied into an agricultural society. And three times a year they had to come before God. Let's go to Exodus 34. And I'm going to tie all this together for you and hope it's a blessing because it has to do with the rapture of the church. In, in one way, as well as, as the resurrection of Jesus and those who resurrected with him, the rapture is actually a resurrection and then future resurrections on top of that. So Exodus chapter 34 and verse 18 through 23. Exodus 34, 18. The feast of unleavened bread shalt thou keep. Seven days shalt thou eat unleavened bread as I commanded thee in the time of the month Abib. For in the month Abib thou camest out from Egypt. All that openeth the matrix, 
matrix is mine, and every firstling among thy cattle, whether ox or sheep, that is male. So it's not just fruit and food and grain, it's a harvest, but it also has to do with animals. So they're, like I said, 4-H. <laughs> they're an agricultural, they're farmers. They're like a farming community. And then it says, verse 21, Six days shalt thou work, but on the seventh day thou shalt rest. In earing, earing time. Earing has to do with, with plowing. That's an old English way of saying plowing time. And in harvest thou shalt rest. And thou shalt observe the feast of weeks of the first fruits of wheat harvest and the feast of ingathering at the year's end. Now the feast of ingathering has to do with tabernacles. So I might need to write that up here. Tabernacles is also called the feast of ingathering. And what's interesting, and I wasn't going to go there in this message, but there are some passages in the Old Testament that when you do the Feast of Tabernacles, you're supposed to build a little booth. And you build this little booth, and, and it's... You know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of our modern-day fall festival, our carnival, our fair, you know? We have a fair. Uh, we don't, my wife and I, we don't go to the fair. It seems like every time we go there, we spend too much money. But every year, pretty much all over America and really all over the world, do they still do it? I hope they still do. They do a fall fair. And it's all about the agricultural. You know, we've got animals. We've got to go sell them. We've got crops. We're going to go sell them. And they build themselves little booths. And usually, you know, they do little expos and they give their little awards to who has the most beautiful animal and things like that. But it's just, it's, it's amazing how a lot of the stuff that we have as customs today comes from the Bible. But this tabernacle is called the Feast of, of Ingathering, and it corresponds basically to our fair, usually in what, September, October? And it's the end of the, of the harvest season, and it's a time where we can all get together and play because we work so hard during the planting season and gathering and things like that. Then it says, um, well, let me read verse 22. And thou shalt observe the feast of weeks and the first fruits of wheat harvest and the feast of ingathering at the year's end. So this usually is toward the end of the year, September, October. And then we just have, well, remember we read, there starts in November, December, when they start planting all over again. But anyway, and then it says, thrice in the year shall all your men children appear before the Lord God, the God of Israel. So there are three times during the year for sure that they have to go to Jerusalem and appear before the Lord God. What were the three times? Feast of weeks, feast of first fruits, feast of ingathering. Well, the feast of weeks ties in with Passover because Passover is one day and then you have the feast of unleavened bread that comes after that. Okay, now, the second, observe the feast of weeks, okay, Passover, unleavened bread. The of the first fruits of the wheat harvest and the feast of ingathering. So first fruits of wheat harvest. Well, first fruits has to do with this part. So over here, so here, here, and then it says of ingathering here. So there's three times at least every year that every child of Israel has to appear before God. Now let's go to Leviticus 23. And I find that quite interesting because that lines up with the three resurrections. And we're going to look at that, and, and, and I'll spill the beans. I'll just go ahead and say it. And it has to do with what we call first fruits, harvest, and gleanings. And we find those terms in the Bible itself. And I hope you have a King James Bible. I don't know what new versions do. Usually new versions change words. And it's hard to teach what the Bible teaches. And teach a teaching like this that's been taught for many, many years when you get a new version of the Bible because they don't use the same words as the King James. So I just stick with the King James Bible. And it says, uh, Leviticus 23, verse 10. Leviticus 23.10 Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When ye be come into the land which I give you, and shall reap the harvest thereof, then ye shall bring a sheep of the firstfruits of your harvest unto the priest. And he shall wave the sheep before the Lord to be accepted for you. On the morrow after the Sabbath the priest shall wave it. And he, ye shall offer that day when ye wave the sheep, and he lamb without blemish of the first year for the burnt offering unto the Lord. And the meat offering thereof shall be. And it continues on there. And part of this is thanking God for the crops that you have and bringing a present to him and giving it to his priests. Almost like an Old Testament tithe. And uh, it says here, verse. let's skip down to verse uh, 
16. Even unto the morrow after the seventh Sabbath shall you number fifty days, and shall offer a new meat offering unto the Lord. And shall bring out of your habitations two wave loaves of two tenths deals, and they shall be of fine flour, and they shall be taken with leaven. They are the first fruits unto the Lord. And ye shall offer with the bread seven lambs with out blemish of the first year, and one young bullock, and two rams, they shall be for a burnt offering unto the Lord with their meat offering. And, let's see, what do I want to read down to? Verse 22. A lot here, I don't want to read it all, but you saw first fruits. The word first fruits. Alright, now skip down to verse 22. And when you reap the harvest of your land, thou shalt not make clean riddance of the corners of thy field when thou reapest, neither shalt thou gather any gleaning of thy harvest. And we could continue reading, but I'll stop there. But there's three words that I see that keep coming up. And these words are first fruits, first fruits, harvest, and gleaning. Now, if you have ever planted anything in your life, you have an idea of what that means. We have out on our porch some banana peppers, some jalapeno peppers, and some tomatoes, and some other things, strawberries and other things. And I'll just tell you, I, I don't usually plant from seed. I usually cheat. I'll go to Lowe's or Walmart or someplace, and I'll buy a plant that's already that big. That way it's ahead of the game. I don't have to wait any longer. And I'll plant that in a big, huge box, and we water it every day, and we wait. Well, that plant grows and grows and grows and grows, and the very first tomato, or the very first bell pepper, or the very first banana pepper, that's the first fruit. And usually there's just one. Now there's still blooms and everything, but one comes out first. And I, oh yeah! And I get excited about it, because that's the one that I can't wait. Because I love to eat what I plant. And when I get the first one, I get all excited. I go, oh, my first fruit! My first fruit! And usually after I delight in and enjoy that first one, it's not long after, then all of a sudden, especially when it begins to be really hot, like it's starting to get now, it's going to be a hot summer, I'm afraid. All of a sudden, there begin to be more and more and more. And it gets to the point where you go out and you look at the plant and you go, Oh my heavens, there's no way I can eat all this. <laughs> I'm so glad my family is five people. Because uh, some of these plants right now are so big, I can't eat all that fruit. It's, it's overwhelming. It's more than I... So we've been pulling off banana peppers about that big and giving them away to friends and family and, and uh, church people. And, and we're getting more than we can actually eat. What is that? That's the harvest. And the harvest is abundant. And you usually get so much, it's more than you can keep up with. Now, if it's your own personal use like ours, it's fun because you can eat it. But it also, it kind of hurts to see some go to waste. I don't like to waste food. But if you're growing it to sell, boy, you're getting excited because you're getting a harvest and now you can go sell that and have some money in your pocket. So you've got the first fruits, then you've got the harvest. The harvest is when you get the most abundant from the plants. Then you have what's called the gleaning. And the gleaning is after the, the prime time of the year when the plant is bringing things to harvest. Usually there's some plants that were a little sluggish. They didn't quite make it. They, were, they grew a little smaller. Maybe they came up a little later from seed than the others. And the harvest is over, but there's just a couple of plants left, and every now and then they'll put on one or two more. And you go out and you go, oh, what a delight. We already harvested. We got rid of that a long time ago. But now we got a couple more little tomatoes. Oh, a couple more little banana peppers. You know, for a time there, we were sick of them. We are getting too many. Like today, I went out. And I got one, two, three, four plants. And they're probably four foot tall. And I got a whole bag full of banana peppers. And I looked at that and said, there's no way I can eat all that. And that's the harvest. And I'm giving it away. But I bet you anything, in a couple of months, I'll be like, oh, if I just had another banana pepper, man. And I'll probably go out and there'll be one or two left. I'll be like, yay, the gleanings. So that's your first fruits, harvest, and gleanings. Well, these tie in to these feasts. And the way God looks at it up in heaven is the way God sees it is, I made man and I want man to come to heaven with me. And I need them to accept me and trust me and I want them to come up with me. God looks down on the earth like a harvest. And he wants to harvest his fruit. Those who come to him for salvation. So he's going to take them with him up to heaven. When? Well, there was a time when he took them up. When he came down and died and he went up. Remember, you plant a seed. It's got to die before it can grow and resurrect. So Jesus. Then in the church age, there's going to be a rapture when he takes them up. And then in the tribulation, there are going to be some people that should have gotten over here, should have been producing fruit over here in the harvest, but they'll miss it 
And God says, okay now, you can still come to me. It's not quite too late. But you're going to pay a price. Usually when you get the gleanings, they're not the best fruits. They've usually got something wrong with them. They usually got a little black spot, or usually don't get as big as the other fruits. They're kind of stunted. Just like the first fruits, they're, they're not always the best. The, the harvest is where you get the best selection of fruits. So, with that said, let's go to the Bible. Let me show you some stuff. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 15. And if, you, if you're a Christian, and you're saved, and you've studied with me before, and you know your Bible, you'll know what I'm saying. Amen? <laughs> If you don't, you might look at this and you kind of scratch your head going, what is, he gonna, what is he saying? Well, as I go to more scriptures, maybe you'll understand. But this is interesting. This is the, the Dispensational Truth book by Clarence Larkin. And here's his chart on this. And if you have this book, it's on page 104. And he, he just calls it the Resurrections. And he has first fruits, harvests, gleanings. And that's what we're doing today. We're looking at the first fruits, the harvests, and gleanings. So let's go to 1 Corinthians. And I told you before that these feasts are not just a time for man to get together and have a party. These are feasts that mean something to God because he told Israel to keep them. And they are prophetic of events that will come and take place in the life of Jesus Christ. Now let me tell you real quick who Jesus is. Jesus Christ is God manifest in the flesh, the Bible tells us, in 1 Timothy 3.16. Only in the King James Bible, by the way. Other versions take that uh, out, who he is. It just says, he who? Well, who is he? Well, the Bible says God, Jesus Christ, is God manifest in the flesh. And the Bible says that the gospel is 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. And the gospel is that how Christ died, Jesus, God, loved this world enough that he died for our sins. And how he was buried and how he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. So it's the resurrection of Christ. So Jesus Christ is tied in with the first fruits, with this number one, because he died during the Passover feast. And three days later, he rose again. So he's tied in with the first fruits. Okay, so the first fruits are the beginning of the church age. And so let me move the two over a little bit so I don't get it confused with you. Harvest is, is, is more all of the church age saints. They're harvested at the rapture. But the beginning is the first fruits. Now let me show you this in the Bible. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20. And it says, But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. How can one man be the first fruits? It says Jesus is the first fruits. Why didn't they say he's the first fruit? Why does it say first fruits with an S? Why is that? Well, because Jesus didn't rise alone. You see, when Jesus rose from the dead, he took up to heaven with him a certain group of people. So that is why he's called the first fruits. Did I read verse 23 as well? Maybe not. Let me read it. But every man in his own order. It's talking about the resurrection of the dead. Verse 21. Every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits. Okay, plural. Why is it plural? I'm going to show you here in a minute. Afterward, they that are Christ at his coming. So the context is the resurrection. And it says the first resurrection is Christ, the first fruits, plural. And then afterwards, there will be other resurrections. And it all ties into this agricultural thing and these feasts. And it all ties into first fruits, harvest, and gleanings. So the first fruits is Christ. Okay, So Jesus rose from the dead and went up to heaven. And when he did, he took some people with him. Let's go back to the book of Matthew and let me show you this. Matthew chapter 27. And look what the Bible says. I... I, I don't think I've ever heard a preacher preach on this passage of Scripture in Matthew 27. And yet it's right there in the Bible. Very seldom do you hear people talk about what happened when Jesus rose from the dead. In Matthew chapter 27, and verse 50, we read, Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. So here's Jesus on the cross, dying for our sins. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. The earth did quake and the rocks rent. Now look at verse 52. And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose. And look at when that took place. And came out of the graves after his resurrection, and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. So, when Jesus died, he was three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And when he rose again, there's some people that rose again with him. Who are they? Well, if you know your Bible, in the Old Testament, 
When you died, there was two places that you could go. You went to Abe's bosom, your soul that is, or you went to hell. And so if you're alive back here in the Old Testament, and you pleased God by keeping his law, and when you sin, making a blood atonement sacrifice, because it's the blood that saves, then when you died, your soul went to Abraham's bosom. And your body went to the grave and was buried. And when Jesus rose again from the dead, that's when the soul came out of Abraham's bosom and the body rose from the grave. And so this body rose with Jesus, and that's why it's called the first fruits with an S. And so you had these people, and there's no other term to call them that I know of, but the Old Testament saints. So the first fruits, the number one first fruits, would have to be the Old Testament saints. And that's when, and why are they saints? Well, because they didn't go to hell. <laughs> they, they, they weren't saints like New Testament saints, because New Testament saints, when we die, the Bible says our soul goes to heaven, but our body goes to the grave. So there's a lot of difference between Old Testament and New Testament. You've got to get a hold of that. But these first fruits would be what we call the Old Testament saints, whose soul was in Abraham's bosom and whose body was in the grave. And when Jesus came back, they came back together and were resurrected and got resurrected together in a glorified body. So that would be the first part of the first resurrection, and that would be what we call first fruits. And that's the Old Testament saints. Now, I could give you more verses on that. I just do not have time. But uh, we read that in, I believe it's Ephesians, where it says that Jesus Christ descended into the heart of the earth and led captivity captive. These, their souls were captive down here in Abraham's bosom. The blood of an animal could not uh, save them. It had to be the blood of Christ, because that's eternal salvation. So they, they had to stay there until they could be resurrected. And with Jesus Christ, there was a resurrection, and that's the first fruits. All right, so now let's look at the second one that we call harvest. And what is the harvest of the world going to be? When is the harvest? When is the next resurrection of the dead? Well, let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. This is a passage known as the rapture. And Paul is the one that God told all about the rapture, and he's the one that kind of reveals this to us. Yeah, maybe in the book of John, Jesus alludes to it a little bit, but doesn't really outright say there's going to be a rapture. Now, he does tell his disciples, in my Father's house are many mansions. You know, I go there to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will come again and receive you unto myself. Well, I, when is he going to do that? Well, that will be at the rapture. So it kind of alludes to the rapture there, but doesn't fully explain what it is and what it's about. Well, 1 Corinthians 15 explains it, how we're changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. It's a resurrection. And in um, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 15, it says... For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. And then look verse 17. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Now I don't have time to read the whole passage. But this is the rapture. And so the rapture is when Jesus will return for his body, which is the bride. And so the rapture will be Jesus returning to take people, all right? If you died in this time period from Jesus to the rapture or the church age, then your body goes to the grave. But if you're saved, your soul goes to heaven. So when Jesus comes at the rapture, he brings the souls of those in heaven with him, and their bodies resurrect, and they come together and they get a glorified body. And the Bible clearly tells us that we're going to get a glorified body. So the harvest is going to be New Testament saints. And it's a rapture. Now, if you're not dead yet, and Jesus comes and you're alive, then your body will change in a moment, and you'll have a glorified body. And your soul will go up to heaven with Jesus. Now let me show you a couple, or well, one more verse on that. Philippians 3. So we who are Christians who are saved, we are waiting for the rapture of the church. And that's going to be the harvest. Now let's go to Philippians 3. And let me show you what Paul says that, that we're waiting for. Philippians chapter 3, verse 20. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, 
What is that? That's my sinful flesh. Change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. So, the rapture is the return of Jesus at that time to resurrect all who died in Christ that were saved. And those who are saved today, we all get changed into a glorified body and taken up to heaven with Jesus. Remember, these three times that they had the feast, they appeared before the Lord. Well, this time they appeared before the Lord as the first fruits. Here, everyone who's been saved during the church age appears before the Lord. And it all corresponds with a feast. Now, which feast is it? Well, some people say it's Pentecost. I wonder if it's not trumpets. And, and I kind of go back and forth sometimes, you know. But I really think that the rapture is going to have to correspond with one of the feasts. The only question is which one. <laughs> some people think Pentecost. Some people think trumpets. Uh, the thing that I've been hearing lately is, and I've heard this before, several years ago, so I always thought this. But before I thought this, I always thought Pentecost rapture. Because while I was in Bible school, we were told, Holy Spirit comes down at Pentecost and acts. So, Holy Spirit goes back up at Pentecost. At the rapture. Makes sense. Spring rapture. But last several years, people have been saying, well, Paul said the rapture comes at the last trump. When is the last trump? Well, on the Feast of Trumpets, the Jews blow a trump, and they blow it a hundred times. And the trump is the sound the trumpet makes. And the last time they blow that trumpet, the hundredth time, that's known as the last trump by the Jews. So some say fall rapture, and the rapture is the harvest, and it's going to kick off with the, with the Feast of Trumpet. I don't know. Others say, no, Brother Breaker, you've got to understand, the Pentecost, that's the last trump. So, I, I don't know. I, I have no idea. I, I can't get it together. I guess we'll just have to wait and see. <laughs> and uh, the sooner the Lord comes back, the better. But we have first fruits, harvest, and gleanings. All right? With the first fruits, we clearly see that one's done. Jesus did resurrect. And he did take people with him. Thus the term first fruits, plural. Okay? So that one's done. Now the next one is the harvest when the rapture takes place. Check mark. That's going to take place soon. That hasn't taken place yet. But I check mark it because we just talked about it. Now we've got one more to talk about. What is that? The gleaning. Well, let's look at this. Let's go to Revelation chapter 20 and verse 4. Now, the rapture is when those who are saved, who have trusted in the blood atonement of Christ, the gospel, 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4, and the Bible is how that Christ died. The gospel is all about how Jesus died. How did he die? He shed his blood. So it's all about the blood atonement of Christ. It's so important that you understand the blood is what saves you, and you must trust in the blood. If you're trusting in the blood of Jesus, you will be raptured when the rapture comes. But if you miss the rapture because you weren't saved, a lot of people ask, well, do I have a chance? Do I have an opportunity? Can I be saved in the tribulation period? Well, the answer to that is yes, but it's going to be very, very hard. Let me show you what I mean. Revelation chapter 20, verse 4. And in Revelation chapter 20, verse 4, look what it says. And I saw thrones, and that they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. Okay? And who's that? That's those that went up to the rapture. We get to sit on thrones. Wow, what an amazing thing. It's a wonderful thing to be saved. But then the next part of the verse says, And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast nor his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. So, the Bible teaches that if you miss the rapture, you're going to be here in a day and age for seven years, another seven. The tribulation period is seven years. And during that seven-year period, the Antichrist is going to come on the scene. He's going to give what he calls the mark of the beast. And we talked a little bit about it. Does it, have, does it tie in with the vaccine and the quantum uh, uh, dot tattoo and these things? Uh, very well, sounds like it. But if you take the mark of the beast then according to the Bible, you can't be saved. Because in the book of Revelation, it says, they that took the mark of the beast, when Jesus returns in Armageddon, he takes them and he puts them down in hell. So you go to hell if you take the mark of the beast. So there's only two things you can do if you want to be saved. I kind of hate to use that term because it's way different. In the tribulation, but if you want to be, quote, saved in the tribulation, 
Jesus said, he that endureth to the end shall be saved. So you've got to try to endure seven years without buying or selling. Because the Bible says, they that have not the mark of the beast cannot buy or sell. Well, how do you eat if you can't buy or sell? I've never met a person in my life that fasted for seven years and they're just fine and dandy. No, if you go seven years without eating, you starve to death. So I guess you could say I believe in Jesus and starve to death, but there's no guarantee that you'll be saved that way because you didn't endure to the end. Jesus said, He that endureth to the end. Well, if you die of starvation, then you didn't endure to the end of the seven years yet. <laughs> you might have endured to the end of your life, but you didn't make it to the end of the seven years. So what we just read was, well, the other option is become a martyr for Jesus. And a martyr is someone who gives their life for Christ. And if you do that, and you allow the Antichrist to cut your head off, what does the Bible say? And we saw the souls of them that were beheaded in heaven before the throne of God. So here is what we call the gleanings. And so the gleanings would be those who came to Christ during the tribulation. But they didn't get saved just by believing. They had to give their life for Christ because that's the only way their soul went before the throne of God. So who would these be? These would be the tribulation saints. And what happens to them? I just read you the verse, Revelation 20 and verse 4. They had to literally die for Jesus. You see, here in the church age, Jesus loved us enough, he died for us. And we say, thank you, Jesus, for dying. He shed his blood for us. We said, thank you, I accept it. And when we accept it by faith, we're saved when we go at the rapture. But as soon as the rapture takes place, it changes. All right, now do you want to get to heaven? Now you've got to suffer and bleed and die and shed your blood for Jesus. You've got to be willing to die for him. Because before he died for you, and you can be saved by him dying for you, now it's different. Now you've got to die for him. So the souls of those in heaven are the ones that told the Antichrist, I will not take your mark. And they said, well, okay, we'll just cut your head off. Okay, I believe in Jesus, not in the Antichrist, so go ahead and chop your head off. And guess what? Then you go up to heaven. And your soul is in heaven, but your body is still down here in the grave. And so when is it that you get your glorified body? You see, they got their glorified body here. We get a glorified body there. So these people whose body is in the grave during the tribulation, but their soul's in heaven, it must be at Armageddon that they come up. Because the verse says, and let's look at it again, they will reign with Jesus. So it says there in... Um, 20 and verse 4, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Well, they must have died. I mean, I haven't seen anyone that walked around with their head cut off and they were still alive. So they died. Their heads were, were cut off. They were beheaded for Christ. I'll, I'll write that up here. Beheaded. So they are resurrected at the end of the tribulation. And their soul comes back down and their body, and they're allowed to live in a glorified body. Well, it sounds like they do if they're reigning with Jesus. So they'll have a glorified body like us. So this would be the tribulation saints. Now, let me tell you why this is important to know. There are some people out there that take this and they twist it to teach it a little differently. Some people say that the tribulation saints are raptured too. And I don't believe in a second rapture. I heard somebody, they sent me a video, and they said, Brother Breaker, watch this video. This guy preaches, and he says, Now, if you miss the rapture of the church, don't worry. You can go with the second rapture. <laughs> and I look at that and go, There's no second rapture in the Bible. If you miss the rapture, then you're in trouble. You're going to have to be willing to die for Jesus. You're not going to say, Oh, I'm just waiting for him to come back again, take me out again. It doesn't happen that way. The rapture is the rapture. Now, if you're going to be taken to Jesus, it's going to have to be by being beheaded. There's no second rapture. But I wanted to teach this, and I want to show you this, because I want you to see it. Now let's go to Matthew chapter 13, and I'll close with this. And I think it's a good teaching. I enjoy this teaching. Uh, I hope you understand it. <laughs> and uh, I've held off for a while talking about it, because, well, it's just, I don't want to confuse people, and I can see how it can be a little confusing. But it's really not. If you understand agriculture, you understand the feast, it kind of, narrows down when the rapture will be. I think the rapture is going to have to be probably in one of these two feasts, either the Feast of Trumpets or the Feast of Pentecost. Well, 
And this year, Pentecost is almost over. So is it going to be here or is it going to be there? All I know is Jesus is coming soon. And if he's doing things based upon these feasts, then my thought is, well, the rapture is probably going to happen on one of the feast days because the feasts all point to Christ and they're prophetic. But let's look at what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 13 because... These are all of the saved people. All right, I'm going to use the term saved with quotation marks because it's hard to call Old Testament saints saved when in the Old Testament they didn't even go to heaven when they died. They had to wait for what the Bible calls eternal salvation, which is what Jesus did. But they go to heaven, and so they're in heaven. So they're saved now, at least. We know now they're saved because they're in heaven. The harvest, saved people. Gleanings, well, I guess if you get your head cut off, then you're saved because your soul's in heaven before the throne of God. So you would say these are the people that are saved. Well, the question then is, well, what about all these people that died and went to hell? Do they ever come out? Do they ever get a resurrection of their body? Well, yes, they do. And the Bible teaches that in the book of Revelation. It tells us about how at the end of the millennial kingdom, all that are in hell come out and stand before God at the great white throne of judgment, and they're judged for all their sins, and then they're cast into the lake of fire. So they are literally resurrected in their bodies. And then it says that their body and their soul is put in hell. Now let's go to Matthew chapter 13, and, and for fun, look at what Jesus said. And I find this very interesting, because Jesus is talking about his ministry on earth and all this in a way that it's like he's whittling it down for a farmer, and he's saying, now you know how y'all uh, get together and, and you have first fruits harvest and gleanings and all that, and then you harvest? We well, said, well, to me, that's what the world is like. I let all these people live, and I, I give them a free will. I give them a choice to accept me or not. And those that accept me, why, they're fruit to me. Which is interesting because, well, when you get saved, you're fruit to the Lord. And he says, and then I, I take them up and I harvest them. And so look at what he says here in Matthew chapter 13, verse 24. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. And while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. And when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. And then it says here, so the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? And he said unto them, As an enemy hath done this. The servants said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat unto my barn. All right, so what is this? He's talking about the kingdom of heaven, which is the millennial kingdom. And he's saying, now, in this time, there's going to be people that love me and serve me. You see, there will be people in the tribulation that make it through. In the book of Revelation, it talks about the Jews and how God protects them for 1,260 days. So they get into the millennium in their natural bodies. And so they'll be God's people then. But then in the book of Revelation, it tells us that there'll be some tares. There'll be some bad people that don't like Jesus. And that God will actually let the devil out of the lake of fire for a short time at the end of the millennium and see who he can take with him. And the devil's going to get a lot of people to go with him. And then the tares will be cast out. And then those in the millennium that follow Christ, then they're going to be brought up here. Now, will they be saved? There's a lot of questions that I have that I still haven't got together. Can a guy be saved in the millennium? Well, I guess there's going to be people in their natural bodies still alive during the millennium. And they're going to have to go before the great white throne of judgment and give account of themselves. So what will they, will they be saved? I mean, there must be some people that are faithful to Jesus during the millennial kingdom. But this is it. This is what I wanted to share with you. I hope it's a blessing. It's, um, like I said, it's, it's not something that's easy to teach. Because sometimes there's more questions than answers. But if you look at the Bible, and this, like I said, was I was taught in Bible school. I also have that in this book, uh, Dispensational Truth. And I look at the thing and I say, well, I, it's hard to get it all together. I'm sorry if I didn't do a great job of teaching it. <laughs> but I do see clearly Christ the first fruits. Well, you have first fruits, harvest, gleanings. I do see clearly the harvest, the rapture. And then I see, well, there are people in the tribulation who do become martyrs for Christ and their souls in heaven. 
and they do get some sort of a glorified resurrection, resurrected body, because they're reigning with Christ in the millennium. So it works. It makes sense. But what do you do with people in the millennium going before the great white throne of judgment? Will somebody that is actually at the great white throne of judgment actually make it to heaven? By their works. Well, in the millennial kingdom, it's all about do this, do that, do this. So it's, uh, it's interesting when you get to that point to, to know what to do. And I've always had questions about that. My dad and I were like, will it be possible to go before the great white throne of judgment and be saved? <laughs> well, if you were lost and you were in hell, then you're not saved. But I guess there will be some people that make it through the millennium that were obedient to Christ. Now, uh, one of the main questions I get is, well, Brother Breaker, if I go up at the rapture and get a glorified body, does that mean I die again in the millennial kingdom? No. No, once we've got our glorified body, we can't die again because it's a resurrection. But the last resurrection is the resurrection of the lost dead from here. And they're resurrected to stand before God at the great white throne of judgment. And then they're cast into the lake of fire. Oh, well, well, I feel like I did my best. I hope that's a blessing. And like I said, it's, it's an interesting teaching. I haven't taught it before because I don't want to confuse you. And I hope you don't get confused. I hope you look at it the way the Bible says as, oh, wow, it's like an agricultural thing. Seven feasts. Three of those feasts, you had to come before God. And in those three feasts, why, you had to appear before God. How amazing how they line up with every time God takes someone up and gives them a glorified body and, and they appear before God in heaven. So, interesting. I hope that's a blessing. I've got to preach this in Spanish now. So I appreciate you watching. God bless. Bye-bye.